I'm very pleased uh, to moderate this panel, uh, which is essentially about technology, social media, and the way that it affects our lives, especially the lives of uh, those adolescents in our lives. Uh, and we have three wonderful panelists today, two of whom are alum, and one of whom is enormously important for the functioning of the college. Let me introduce our panelists. Uh, Daly, who's Daly received her PhD here in clinical psychology from Teachers College, uh, where in addition to her clinical practice, she now serves as one of our trustees. Daly is a TC trustee. Uh, she was an original member of the McKean Psychiatric Service with the Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. She worked there for seven years conducting individual and group therapy on the inpatient unit at Presbyterian Hospital and has variously been an individual group and family therapist at the Columbia Day Treatment Program for 15 years. She's also importantly vice chair of the Wildlife Conservation Society, a member of the advisory board to the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford and a member of the leadership team for the Stanford Arts Initiative. So thank you for joining us, Daly. And Elizabeth Reed is another one of our esteemed alum from the TC Clinical Psychology Program. And since then, she's completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the New York Psychoanalytic Society and Institute. She has a private practice in New York City, seeing children, adolescents, and adults. And then Danelia Rosa, who got her PhD from Adelphi University, has been with us for many years, serving in the enormously important capacity as the director of the Dean Hope Center for Psychological and Educational Services, that of course is the center here at the college uh, where our students, under wonderful supervision, uh, see children, adolescents, and adults for both assessment uh, and psychotherapy. So those are our panelists. And I'm going to spend a couple of minutes introducing the topic before I hand this over to each of the panelists. We're going to speak for a few minutes about different aspects of this issue. And then uh, we'll take some questions, have some discussion, and later on drink some wine, right? <laughs> um, technology. So the basic piece here is the extent to which the internet and social media have really revolutionized our lives. It's an overstated... Uh, it's a cliche of sorts, the extent to which there's a, you know, a revolution in paradigms, but in fact, there may well be in this case. Uh, cell phones, uh, logging, social media sites like Facebook, uh, as many of you know who have kids, or as many as you know because you do it as well, uh, is often now preferred for actual face-to-face -face conversations, which has changed dramatically the way that we do communicate with each other, with implications that our panelists will speak about. Uh, one of the things we'll speak about, too, is whether, or the extent to which, and the ways in which there are costs and benefits to this revolution in communication. What have we gained in this translation to new ways of being with each other, and what perhaps have we lost? One possible benefit that researchers and theorists have pointed out is that rather than avoiding intimacy, it's perhaps possible to think of these new ways of communication as enhancing the possibility for intimacy. Um, not just in terms of the numbers of people we can connect to, but the ways in which we can connect and the things that we perhaps can say, sometimes more easily, through technology than face-to-face -face communication. Um, costs. I mean, obviously, or not obviously, but nevertheless, there's been more written about the cost and the benefits of new technology, including disembodiment. What is the nature of virtual relationships where we connect with each other, but actually not while we're looking at each other? Anonymity and the loss of tact. People have written extensively about this awful phenomenon of uh, cyberbullying and also the awful phenomenon of, uh, of, of sexting. Um, the notion of, particularly among children and adolescents, the pressure of needing, wishing, having to constantly communicate, constantly having to update, constantly checking as to what others are doing can lead to enormous social pressures and anxiety. Uh, even the notion of impression management, like I have to worry all day about how I'm, how I'm putting myself out there, how others are seeing me. Um, parents have complained about the extent to which social media have 
as the use of social media has led to a decrease in other activities, particularly family activities, family time. You know, trying to pull your way, trying to pull your kids away from uh, Facebook. You know, finding in the middle of the night they're still posting things on Facebook. Um, possibility of internet addiction has been written about kids who are you know, online virtually constantly. Uh, and for now, at least, the last perhaps um, risk factor here is what kids are likely to call TMI. How many of you know what TMI is? Good. <laughs> Too much information. Uh, the extent to which in living in this virtual constancy of the social media world, the extent to which you will reveal more information than is necessary that will get you in trouble. Okay. Easy to make fun of this. There's uh, a couple of ways that people have made fun of it. I'll let you read this yourself. You don't need me to read it for you. But these are some of the quips that have evolved over the years about Facebook in particular. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last one I'll read because it's a little far down on the screen and some of you can't read that. The last one says, I was trying to explain the concept of Twitter to my friend. He finally said, I don't follow you. <laughs> Uh, questions that we'll think about <coughs> today and perhaps in the future. Uh, one piece in particular that's been written about is the extent to which social media may actually increase narcissism among children, adolescents, and even adults. Uh, both sides of this issue. Yes, it encourages adolescents to constantly promote themselves, broadcast the minutia of their lives. They can't help but become more narcissistic by doing so. No. Uh, this is a quote from a colleague at Yale University. The common complaint about these technologies is that people are becoming more self-absorbed and narcissistic. It's going to tear at the fabric of society when people form trivial connections with others rather than participating in their communities and having rich interactions. These complaints are the same ones people made generations ago about the telephone and automobile. It's similar to the notion you know, that we complain about kids in ways uh, that are seemingly new, but in fact we can go back to quotes by Socrates and Plato and find out that the Greeks 2,500 years ago were complaining about the same thing, even though apparently they did not have Facebook. Uh, the questions that we're going to be dealing with today in the next however much time we have left are essentially three, uh, but it's essentially how what are the effects of this constant barrage of social media on youth's lives, including their development, including the risk for some dangerous activities, as Daly's going to speak about to a certain yeah. extent, uh, the effect on social and family relationships, which Danelli is going to speak about, and lastly, uh, how do new technologies and media affect the way that kids enter into therapy, speak with their therapist, um, and, and communicate their, their concerns in psychotherapy. So with that as a very quick introduction, let me give this over to Dr. Daly Petty. Uh, my remarks today really emanate from a jet lag television browse in Paris, a 4 a.m. desperation. <laughs> trying to get to sleep, waiting for another false alarm from my daughter, who was having a baby a week late. In the span of 20 minutes, I've heard first the CEO of eBay describing innovations in buying methods and marketing, and I became convinced by him that shopping as we know it is going to very soon be put in the category that you and I now put hunter-gatherers or uh, potlatch um, societies. Anyway, more striking that night was a terrific debate on the relationship of, uh, between social activism and the internet. Uh, I spent my adolescence uh, in social activism, and I see a number of, uh, and have treated a number of adolescents. And all of a sudden, here were terms unknown to me. Collectivism, slacktivism, hacktivism, Filter bubbles, 
and a host more culture jamming in many uh, forms and with many names. These things are being banding about in such a way that I kind of panicked a little. I really honestly felt, yes, the world really is changing. And am I going to be able to talk to my grandson? Am I going to be able to be at all in the same, uh, in the same world? So uh, I, for this presentation, I thought I would just present a few of the results from my very cursory uh, review of the literature on internet use in adolescence, and uh, then give my impressions of how this may or may not be good for adolescent development. And um, that's it. So, Collectivism is both a descriptive and a goal. In one sense, it is the young person. Notice that even in the definition, it's for the young person. A collectivist is a young person who expresses social conviction in non-labor-intensive ways, by signing an internet uh, petition, or by forwarding material about a cause to friends on network sites. Now it's even easier, all you have to do is Put the uh, push the click uh, the plus key on Google. Um, I don't know how many of you have known uh, or have been aware of two debates that uh, two events that have been very central and really embody the notion of collectivism. One of which is a film produced by a group called Invisible Children, which is a uh, and it's called Kony 2012, and Joseph Kony is a uh, Ugandan who uh, spent many years sending children, uh, females, into slavery and boys from the age of six on into the army. And it was extremely professionally um, done. It was extremely moving. It went from 60,000 to over a hundred million hits and visitors to this site in less than two or three weeks. Um, although the group Invisible Children is not the best at uh, revealing its financial uh, information, uh, they have said that way over $10 million has come into this group, which got a lot of celebrity rapport and turned a lot of young children into the streets, really trying to organize to get Joseph Coney out of business. Well, then it turns out that the film uh, actually wasn't as accurate as one might have thought, that uh, Joseph Coney doesn't live in Uganda, that uh, the organization that he's involved with is basically not there, and that uh, the film by Ugandans was experienced as extremely uh, paternal and downputting. So w when people have gone and done the research, they found out that, oops, indeed, um, a very small portion, less than 40% of what they raised actually goes to the cause, and nobody exactly knows where it's going. So you have the wonderful positive experience of all these young people turning out and then they are asked to spend a tremendous amount of money to get the kid and blah, blah, blah. The other case, of course, I'll just say a sentence or two, is the Trayvon Martin case, where uh, he, you know, was killed, and there was this sort of silence about it, and here we are, and we're going with stand ground law in Stanford, Florida, and uh, all of a sudden, Somebody got really mad and went to um, the New York, uh, what's his name, Al Sharpton, who organized 5,000 people in three hours through social networking to get down to Florida. And that's how uh, that gets um, sort of put throughout society. And that's where young people are learning and fighting and having a terribly uh, vicious um, racial battle, saying things to themselves in chat rooms 
that you would never think of saying uh, out in public. And um, there is a sort of loosening of inhibition that really comes either in a chat room or in whatever form of social networking that it takes. So as clinicians, what we're really concerned about in adolescence is there's some developmental tasks. Um, are you going to be in the process of sort of separating from your family and developing your own identity? Are you going to um, be able to experience and enjoy intimate relationships? Are you going to be able to, you know, become a little goal-directed and, and feel a little like a cohesive self? And um, I think the answers on that are mixed, uh, and I thought I would just sort of report on a few things that I found in the literature. Uh, Estimates now, as of 2010, there, uh, there was a Pew study which says that 90% of people from 12 to 17 are using Facebook on nearly a, a daily basis. And there was one study that found that in adolescents from 12 to 17, what they wanted most and this was the group that spent the most time on social networking, their absolute number one goal was fame. Um, they didn't kind of care how they got it. I'm not really sure they knew what it was. They were spending a lot of time with uh, social uh, reality television shows. But my concern, and it is an, uh, an observation, um, First of all, the combination of the uh, disembodiment that Barry is talking about, which is a really, really serious issue. You are not there, you are not experiencing. To have an intimate relationship means that you are learning to read others' cues, and very little of that happens in these social networking sites. And the sites in the chat room particularly tend to um, intensify and amplify any divisions that exist within any uh, group. This is all very important in many ways because it is Google and Facebook's stated goal to um, be with you every minute of your life. The CEO of eBay, uh, what he would really like is uh, to be in business with the iPhone. You go out to, uh, his example is, you go out to lunch with your girlfriend, you take a picture of her <laughs> purse, you just then go walk through the streets, find a place that seems to have it, go to the bathroom, look at, and then just click it, and then you just get to go pick up the purse, and your girlfriend is um, happy. Google and Facebook have developed algorithms um, which are really filters for the content that you get. And the algorithms are built in such a way that if you click on content ABC, um, often then you're going to get content ABC back. You're never going to get the other point of view because they've done their research and what they are seeking for all of us to have is the smile, is, is the positive experience because the world is now about capturing attention. That's, it's an, you know, that's what it is. So they're not going to put in front of me um, an ad from Newt Gingrich wanting wanting my money, because that might make me mad and I won't stay online and then I won't buy something. But this, I believe, has very strong and uh, evidence-based uh, effects on societies. I mean, you, you can turn off your filter if you care to, but then you get so much information that it's too much information and the cognitive uh, uh, the frontal cortex of the adolescent brain is at this time 
in the process of putting um, in the process of putting we hope impulse control and uh, a real appreciation of cause and consequence and broader learning. So there's a huge debate as to whether or not it's uh, legal, fair, or um, good for us. Uh, I have to stop in a minute, but it is a very, uh, it's a very rich topic. And I think just the point that I would like to make is there are real pitfalls for developing adolescents. Uh, and if you look at the research on affect control, that should be coming in in later adolescence. But if you've captured them with the passion for anything at the age of 12, then they are going to be skewed. Uh, my personal experience is that I think uh, intense internet users that I've seen um, and I don't really understand, I can't really attribute it, but anyway, I would just say that there's a disjunction between feeling and action, and there's not an appreciation of cause and consequence, and uh, there's a whole cognitive structure that involves being able to get mad at people and deny it, and the other thing it allows you to do is create your own self for a presentation. Some people think that uh, your self-presentation. Somebody think some people think that's a good thing. Some people think that's a bad thing. There are uh, reports on either side of the issue. And, um, and how many people here have adolescent children? <laughs> good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Daly. So one of the things that Daly raised, of course, is the research, and we have to remember that this is a very new phenomenon, so that we don't have all the answers yet about all the implications. We're talking about something that's been going on maybe 10 years at the most. But with that, let me um, bring us, you have one quick question, perhaps, or comment? I'll just to make a yeah. comment that you're referring to the filter bubble. Uh, if you haven't seen the TED Talk of the Eli, uh, Eli Paris, sir, yes. the founder of Move On, yeah. it's about 17 minutes long and describes Great. in detail what that filter bubble yeah. is. Yeah, sure, sure. I went to that debate the other night. It was terrific. And it's uh, Intelligence Square is the organization. Great. Um, OK. Elizabeth, please. Great. So several years ago, I had a supervisor who strongly suggested that I not communicate technologically with my patients, especially the adolescent population. She said, do not give out your cell phone number. Do not email with them. It's just totally inappropriate for therapy. And you know, of course, there's liability issues. There's privacy issues. You're just exposing yourself too much. And as I sit here talking to you today and sort of reflecting on all of this, I would like to say that I'm, I feel happy and a little bit lucky that I didn't completely listen to her. <laughs> and I want to tell you why. I think adolescents today have been born into a completely different world than most of us have been born into. And if you use a, a part of that technology, which is texting, this is a language that they speak. Many of us, I'm sure, use it. I use it. But this is something that they're very comfortable using. And I feel, as, as an adolescent psychologist, if I'm not open to speaking with them, using their language, I'm not going to get to them. My overall goal as a, as a psychologist is to create a therapeutic alliance with patients in the room, face to face. I think John Bowlby said it very well when he said, a therapist's role is analogous to that of a mother who provides her child with a secure base from which to explore the world. So how am I going to use technology to move towards that goal? Well, first of all, there's just a very practical issue, which is I was finding that with adolescent patients, they don't return my phone calls. I can't get them to pick up the phone. So if I'm not being able to just on a practical level get in touch with them, I'm not even getting them in the room to do the work that I'm seeking to do with them. But what I'd like to focus on today is there have been so many unforeseen benefits of me allowing myself to you know, have the technological language of text to use with 
adolescent patients. And I'd like to illustrate that by very briefly telling you about a few different clinical cases of my own that, that kind of illustrate that. The first is a 17-year-old male who came to me uh, with this sort of main presenting problem of anxiety. I mean, he had terrible anxiety. He, he couldn't even really make phone calls. So that was really a part of the, the therapy that we were working on together. Any communication that we had outside of our sort of therapeutic relationship was really through text. It would be very short things. I'm running late, I need to change my appointment. You know, adolescents are always changing what they want to do. So, you know, it would be, uh, you can imagine the, the, the changes that takes place at the last minute. Eight months into my treatment with him, uh, it was a Sunday late morning, I will never forget this, uh, he sent me a suicide note over text and signed his full name at the end. I was actually uh, downtown at my uh, six-year-old's friend's birthday party and as you can imagine, I, I, the wind was knocked out of me. I knew that if I got back to him by calling him, he would not answer the phone and it would increase his anxiety. So I made a, a quick decision to text him and I said, I think we should meet, I want to see you. Will you meet me at my office? It took us about an hour and a half to meet at my office, but in that interim, I was able to use technology and just send him little texts like, um, where are you right now? You know, I knew he had moved recently and actually didn't have his new address. Are you with anybody? Of course he wasn't, he was by himself. He did meet me that evening, um, and then once I got him in my office, I was able to intervene with him. He really needed a, a hospital stay, and um, I look back on that situation, which was extremely scary, and I say to myself, this kind of kid, would he have been able to reach out and get the help he needed had he not been able to use the technology of texting? And, and also, in addition, if I, as, as his psychologist, had not been open to allowing him to text me. I, I can't say for sure, but I, I honestly doubt it. I'll give you another example um, of a 13-year-old adolescent female who came to me with attachment issues. She had really never had anyone in her life that she felt had given her sort of that stable parenting base you know, with which to go out into the world. So a lot of our work together in the beginning of treatment was really just creating a trusting alliance with her. The first three months of our work together was, was really, honestly, very difficult. But three months into it, she leaves my office one day, and she sends me a text message, and I'll read it to you. Sorry I got so mad at you. It's hard, because as I get closer to you, now I know I have something to lose. I'll read you something else that she sent to me at another point in time. Just thinking, every time a parent has another kid, it kind of means the kid they have just wasn't enough. So she was using text in a different way. She was revealing and kind of disclosing things to me that she felt like she couldn't say face to face. And, you know, I think texting, although there's a lot of negative things that we can say for this generation, um, she couldn't say those things to me face to face at that time, but she wanted me to know them. And, and it was a more anonymous way, right? She could take her time, write it, uh, have it sort of written the way she wants it written. She pushes the button and she knows that it, it's delivered to me immediately. Of course, Anything I receive from my patients technologically, I make notes of it, I certainly take it in, and I definitely bring it into the room in the therapy, and it facilitates the work that we do. Another example, I'm always interested to hear what people dream about. Sometimes I will have an adolescent, you know, I'll say to them, if you don't write them down, you often won't remember your dreams. But uh, these kids are not sitting with, you know, pen and paper next to their beds. Sometimes I'll get a text and it'll just be, I just had a dream about X, remind me to tell you about it on Tuesday. So it's sort of a way of saying, I'm gonna hand you this, will you just hold this for me until I'm there? I recently had a situation with a, an older adolescent patient from the Middle East who studies here and had to go home for a family emergency. And it really turned into a crisis and she wasn't sure she was gonna be able to come back here, although she really wanted to. And she sent me a text message and she just said, I'm really struggling, can we set up a session on Skype? We did, and I think it really helped her. I don't think any of these things would have been possible five years ago without these advancements in technology. And I want to stress the fact that I'm not conducting therapy through the internet or online. I am merely 
using it as a way of facilitating the work that we're doing in the room. You know, it's a way of them reaching out and connecting with me. It really enhances my knowledge and my understanding of them, and I feel like it facilitates the process of the work in the room. Whether I'm holding something like someone's thought or their dream, or they're revealing or disclosing something they just feel like they couldn't say face to face, or, most importantly, that they're in a crisis and they just need to reach out and get help from someone. They're all ways of connecting with me, and even though we see it as sort of a non-traditional root, right, this technology, it's really all going to the same destination, which is a human connection. Um, the last thing that I would like to say is I'd like to just end with a, a visual, and I'm sure we can all imagine this. Typical 15-year-old girl walks in my office. She's got, you know, ripped jeans and long hair that's kind of covering half of her face. <clears throat> Terrible attitude. You know, she's just in a bad mood. She's, she's angry at the world. My parents suck. Nobody understands. I'm really pissed off. She doesn't even know why she's there to see me. And I look at her. And as I look more closely, I see someone whose body is changing, whose mind is developing, <coughs> and she's really questioning herself. You know, am I enough? Am I going to fit in? Who am I going to become? She's not only angry, but she's really afraid. And the point I want to make about this is that when I sit across from her and I see her, I see a part of myself. And I'm sure that everybody in this room remembers what it was like to be 15 and to feel insecure, to feel angry, and to feel a little bit confused. I think that technology has changed. That is the difference. But people are really the same. And I feel like if we can be open to listening to adolescents on their terms, using their language, we might just hear something, and they might just reveal something you know, really important. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Uh, obviously, you know, I'm listening to you, and I, and I have uh, two reactions. The first of which is it's kind of a, uh, because I worry a lot that the uh, internet filtering system is going to cause splitting and denial in such large amounts that they'll never be integrated. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say, it didn't sound that way when you were doing it, and I think it's an amazing, I mean, great, good, and good to know. Do you ever wonder, like, what if you'd been in the ocean swimming for two hours when he called? I mean, you, you right. know what I'm saying when they... No, I, I think that's a great point, but I, I would also say, I, first of all, I'm really, uh, I like to text, so for me, it's something I'm very used to. I have uh, young children, so if someone is calling me, it, it's actually, from a practical standpoint, it's much easier for me to respond quickly to a text than it is to a phone call. And I have to say, I was recently talking to a colleague who um, has been a psychologist much longer than I have, and probably more set in his ways, and he started to do the same thing. I actually think it's a quicker way to get to me. And, and in, you know, 10 or 20 years ago, somebody would have called and you're going to get a voicemail. And when is that person going to listen to that voicemail? You can't check it every 10 seconds. So you make a very good point. But I still think it's, it's probably the quickest way to get me. Right. And there, there are people like me who have started a text to a patient last week and I still wouldn't finish. <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was a question back here. Please. Go ahead. No? Hi. Um, my name is and I'm a student here. Uh, the principal of my school in Pakistan, um, five students are deaf at this school, um, they won't discuss any issues, um, only face to face. So, um, so they found out, you know, my email address and Skype, and they now are, you know, using this technology. So I'm not sure how I control, you know, people finding out this information and where are the boundaries. So it, it's a principle, right? So because I, um, I have to be very, I want to be very frank with them, but at the same time, how do you, um, you know, create those lines? You're talking about your patients, and, and you don't mind getting texts, and maybe that will happen all the time. So you know, I, I need the information I need to be able to communicate, um, and I need to be able to do my job as a teacher, but where do you draw those lines? I think that's a terrific question for, for teachers, for therapists, for anyone in, you know, who has a position of authority. How much do you let other people 
you know, have access to your personal life because when the personal life starts um, transitioning into your professional life, there's lots of questions. There's a place. Hi, uh, my yeah. name is Brian Burke. I'm a <coughs> professor and uh, one of the deans in the business school at Yeshiva. I just want to comment. I don't think that, and by the way, I did study a long time, I remember. Uh, <laughs> I did take some uh, clinical psychology courses here when I was here, uh, which is rare for business people to do that. But let me just say that I don't think it's just a matter of texting. I think it's a matter of the fact that they that the embodiment of their reality is completely different than yours. And if you only understand, you know, it's like a person who's trying to has a computer and somebody uses an abacus, right? And I always find that my son who's twelve, right, just one quick story, he goes to a very good school here in the lead school, and the students aren't used by the teachers because they're so technologically deficient. And if you want, look at their Skype messages, you look what they do, they think it's funny, they, they're amused. And actually they learn faster than what the teacher's trying to teach them. So I think you have some issues to deal with in that context. Yeah, we often speak different languages. Another, someone else, yeah, please. How do you move from their communicating to texting to communicating to you It's yet another boundary issue, right? <coughs> I mean, boundary issue. What can they reveal? And the question is, how much access do you allow people into your lives? Mm -hmm. Answers, perhaps, or beginning well, answers? Well, one yeah. uh, thought that I have uh, about the, the boundary issue is in therapy, there's always boundaries, right? We start and we end at the same time. Um, you know, the relationship really happens in the room, but I did have a case where someone was texting me really too much. I, I almost felt, I likened it a little bit to like breastfeeding on demand. I, I couldn't do it. I didn't do it for my own kids. So, uh, and you know what? It's, it's just more information for us because what was she really needing? There was something about what was going on within her that needed to reach out to me like that. And so we talked about it. And you know what? I have to say with my adolescent patients, they're very good about not uh, texting and emailing all the time. They, they really don't. It, it, parents are actually a, a little more difficult and have trouble <laughs> understanding what the boundaries are. Um, Let's take one more question now. We'll go to Danelia and then we'll come back to all these other questions. Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, in terms of the texting and also going along with the boundaries, um, if you're getting more information from this, um, this lack of face-to-face -face almost because it's easier for people, when, when is it okay to transition onto reading Facebook statuses? I mean, uh, Facebook is the ultimate at the moment, like expression of every emotion, and people right. actually take so much time to develop their Facebooks, and even if they do use them as um, a different self-image than their actual ones, as if they're projecting somebody else, that does say something about them. I mean, is it even ethical for us to look into their Facebooks, or? Well, if you're talking about Facebook, personally, me, I actually don't use Facebook. I once did set up an account so I could see someone's friends, kids, and I think I had like seven friends. And then a, a, a patient actually came in and had found me on Facebook and said, you don't have many friends. <laughs> and I should be a So, I mean, these kids have like 1,700 friend, friends. You know, I use that word loosely. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm just fascinated by this issue. Isn't there also an object relations boundary issue uh, that's going to be very serious if Google and Facebook are allowed to be with us 24-7? Um, do you always have your mother here? What does this piece of machinery tend to become? Are you, you know, are you really separating and getting becoming independent if you can reach you and your mother on such a uh, on-demand basis mm -hmm. and just how that affects the consolidation of self? Those are all great questions. I'm going to want to make sure that we have enough time for Janelia's oh. presentation. Then we're going to come back to, <coughs> we'll still have time for some more questions and comments later. Good morning. Um, I enjoy very much the presentation, the introduction of Dr. Reed, because I remember being one of those supervisors <laughs> <laughs> telling Dr. Reed when she was a student in the Dean Hope Center 
no, you don't use cellular phones, you don't text. So I'm happy to know maybe it was me or maybe it was somebody else, but I'm happy to know that I probably was not the only one who told you that at the beginning. But yes, and and it's interesting because you know, I, with my wearing my head as, as a, the director of the training clinic, training students to deal with the technology these days is a big challenge. And as we speak, the American Psychological Association has a task force that is working on how to incorporate the use of the technology into the training of students in the field. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm reevaluating some of those things that I said a couple of years ago, but still, uh, you know, it has to be very uh, cautious. Well. We have uh, the people from the, the guts higher up giving guidelines of how to train our students. The challenge that we have is the technology is moving so fast, immensely fast, and maybe what, it's almost like how do we catch up with that? What I'm going to do today, I'm going to present the, from the family uh, perspective. I'm going to tap on some of the key issues on family systems theory because families are struggling with this. And it's a big challenge when families have one adolescent, but they also have little children, right? So how do you adjust, if you have one computer at home, how do you adjust your rules and regulations for an adolescent uh, and for a, a, a child that is eight years old and a, a little one that is three years old? We, we cannot deny that internet has been an immense educational tool. Uh, it's been very, very great in terms of helping children to learn readiness skills before they come to school. It's, it's, it's great because now from home, they could be stimulated to learn wonderful skills before they come to school. So the challenge is how do we handle the, the, the cons? Everything has pros and cons, right? How do we handle the cons and cons? Uh, this week I met with a father. A part of my, my job in the clinic is to assess if, if some of the cases that are requesting services from our students are appropriate. I met with this father, he has a 15 year old that at age nine was caught by the mother looking at pornography in the computer. Uh, they tried to control that, they put some secure systems in the internet. Now the, the parents found out a big bill on the television. I don't know how, but the child was now accessing private uh, channels and the bill, they found out when they got the bill. Uh, this child a couple of years down the road was caught um, with the penis of a relative in his mouth. And as a result, an ACA, an Administration for Children's Services, got involved, and, and, and this adolescent now is in psychotherapy. The parent was very frustrated, and one of the frustrations is, how, how, is this something I did wrong? Is this something that I should have done with the computer that I didn't do? So the computer, internet, and all this is part now of the challenges that parents have raising children. So let me go quickly through my, um, here, right? So if I talk from, the, I mean, some of the presentations today were more, uh, were, uh, were bringing the, the psychodynamic perspective somehow in terms of how to deal with some of these issues. Everything related to internet and psychology is the tip, tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of research that needs to be done. Some people are starting to write on it, do research on it, but uh, there's much more that needs to be done. I would like to bring to you the perspective of family therapy. And from family therapy systems, uh, families are systems, this is the way it's perceived, right? Fa families are systems that are interconnected, but they're also interdependent individuals, none of who can be understood in isolation from that family system. So this is how, when we take the course on family therapy, this is what we conceptualize. The family is the nucleus, and look at, th this is only an example of all the outside systems that are going to become an interconnection with the family. Um, this is the way we perceive how a family is going to interact with the systems, right? So this overlap, what we believe is the families have to have a permeable, permeable boundary that would allow that in and out in interacting with the systems. So for example, there's an overlap in terms of the leaving, leaving the school system come into this family nuclear system as, as well as all the other systems. Um, there's a theory from Murray Bowen that has a lot of interlocking concepts, but I would like to, so for example, they talk that triangles is when there is a conflict between one family member and another family member, and that conflict is in between, right? So now the parents, are having this conflict with adolescents. It could be because they don't like their girlfriend. It could be because they caught him with drugs. And now, guess what? It's because you're spending too much time in the internet. What is it that you're doing in the internet? Or what 
that I catch that you are doing on the internet. Uh, differentiation of the self. Well, this is an example of how it would be with a triangle, right? So mom and dad, or whoever the family member is, is in conflict with the child because of what, whatever issues are coming up or internet. Differentiation of the self, another concept in family therapy, is the susceptibility to depend on others for acceptance and approval, right? And as all we know, we all know, uh, the differentiation in the adolescent stage is very crucial. This is when they love, but they hate the parents. This is when they want to be treated as a child, but they also want to be treated as an adult. This is when they want to hang out and not tell you what time they could come in, but at the same time, if they're in trouble, they call mom, I'm in trouble. So it's this back and forth, right? And the example I'm putting in the front, it would be the ideal scenario, right, where the family and the child, there's an overlap, but the parents have developed enough trust in this adolescent that he can come and go, right, and now they let the rope go a little further and they test how that adolescent is handling that rope and you let go a little bit more and so forth, right, it keeps going and that will be the model in the top. The model in the bottom is the one where there's completely, is, there's a distance between the family and the adolescent. The adolescent becomes completely disconnected from the family and it starts doing a lot of activities outside that the family might not have any knowledge with, about. Another point, another concept is the dysfunction in relational parents and the patterns in the family. It could be marital conflict, it could be dysfunction in one of the spouse, impairment of one or more children in emotional distance, and what happens when any of these things are going on in the family? Children sometimes try to look for support outside, right? They don't understand what's going on. Sometimes family secrets are going on. They know something is happening with mom and dad. I don't know what it is. Let me then space out. Let me connect outside, and they try to look for friendship and support outside. Another theorist of family therapy, Salvador Minuchin, he talks about three concepts, the triangle that I explained before, but he also talks about the permeable boundaries and problems in communication patterns. So, when, so again, it, when there is rigidity in the family system, and, and, and I could give you an example, and I always tell this to my students, the parent that raised a kid that was eight or nine years old has to eventually learn that the skills that they were using with the nine-year-old are not gonna work with the 17-year-old. So a lot of the conflicts begin when the parents continue to use those rigid disciplinarian mode or roles with the adolescent because now it's not working. I mean, maybe at the little one you could say, well, nighttime, I mean, the car fuel, eight o'clock, you have to be in bed by 8.30, and the kid probably didn't give too much problem with that, but adolescent, probably needs a little extension in that car view. And if the parents are too rigid, right, if that boundary between parents and child is too rigid, there's no permeability, what's gonna happen? Conflicts begin. And the same happens with the pattern of communication. As children grow up, the parents of communication, of parents need to adapt to them, as well as they need to also learn to accommodate to the parents as well, it's not one way. But family therapy comes into work with families and deal with that kind of issues. So all this to say that these are the problems that sometimes are existing already in the family that could affect the way internet, social networks, and all this is integrated into the family system. If this is a family that has shown some level of communication with the adolescents from an early age and was flexible in those boundaries enough to, learn, to teach the child negotiations, when they get to that point of dealing with texting, dealing with uh, uh, the use of social network, there is already an avenue that has been open of how to deal with conflicts, of how to deal with disagreements. If that doesn't exist, then it's not the fault of the internet, right? It's, the, it's okay, how I have been dealing with my adolescent all along. So ideally, this is probably what we want, this model, right? The family, the child, there's some separation, but then some interconnection and that the internet is part of that. Uh, that's basically what I have. I have some resources that I found that are very useful actually. Um, we have uh, the internet safety for kids and families. I'm gonna leave it here so you can write it down. And I didn't know this, a new parent actually came out this year, 2012, a parent's guide to Facebook. I have to tell you that as a parent, uh, again, Facebook came out in 2004, my son was an adolescent. Uh, one of the things that it was very difficult for me, he loved to play this sports game on the internet. 
And one of the new things they have now is that you could play with strangers, right? You could play with people that are in Washington, and, you know, and, and have this very challenging games. And just the thought, when he was trying to talk to my husband and I about this, just the thought that he's talking to a stranger, it's like, what are you talking about playing with a stranger? Of course, my mind was going to what happens, what is it that I'm hearing about predators on the internet, right? So my mind went right away to the predator mode, right? But then I had to regroup. I, I was, the, the, he was talking to me about something completely unknown to me. So as a parent, the generation, which is another of the factors in family therapy that we look at, the, the, the change in generations, sometimes the generations, are, we're not, we didn't grow up with that, right? So it's something that is unknown for us. So rather than trying to get to the mind of the adolescent and tell me what is this, uh, you know, how do you get this, do my homework, look for it, consult to other parents, look for it in the internet about what do I, you know, it's the immediate emotional reaction of going into the mode of, you know, putting setting rules without even knowing what it is. And, and finally, you know, I learned that it was, it was something that it was not as hurtful as I thought it was. Um, questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for, I guess, the whole panel. But um, Dr. Reed, you said that your intention, you essentially said that any form of self-disclosure, even via text, for you as a therapist is better than no self-disclosure. Um, you also said that you try to bring whatever you discuss via technology into the, into the, the room with you. Um, is it your intention, therefore, to wean your clients off of that form of self-disclosure to a more healthful and more, um, you know, developmentally appropriate form of self-disclosure? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, that's a great question because, as I said at the beginning, you know, my goal is to do the work in the room, right, face-to-face, -face, and, and, and ultimately create a secure attachment for them so they can go out in the world, right, and sort of intern, right, you want to sort of internalize the good mother, so to speak, within yourself and go out in the world. I just keep it open that they can, you know, essentially connect with me in that way. Um, if it's the only way I'm going to hear from them, right, something they can't say face to face. But then, you know, when I see them the next time, right, we talk about it. And, and, and clearly they wanted me to know, but it, it just at that moment was too difficult. So to answer your question, absolutely. Any other questions to Elizabeth will have to be texted to her. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I question the notion, I, I love what you said, but I question the notion of things that are new are always good. Uh, you know, I think this is a serious problem. I have these discussions with my grandchildren, and you know, the eldest one will say to me, he's the most aggressive, and then, oh, this is new, this is for, for youth people. Yeah, just because it's new, it doesn't mean it's good. But True. what do you regard as the problem? The problem is trying to get, to inter interact with the youngsters so that they do understand that not everything right. new is good. Right. Right. For one thing, for example, there's a, a very young man who was a, a, a techie, he had a company and so forth and so on. He told me, this was like about a year ago, that he knows a lot of people who have changed their names because they had so much on Facebook before, they didn't want them that information to follow them. Mm -hmm. right. These are dangerous things for some of these kids. And exposing yourself in a public way can really come back to bite you. Absolutely. So, so these are the caveats that I think we ought to be thinking about. Yes, the, the information, the resources that I have here have very specific guidelines. Uh, very specific guidelines about how to communicate with, with the adolescent, but also things that you could do in the house to control the access to the computers. I remember the analogy I used with my son when I was trying to explain this to him because I don't think they have that notion is imagine you're going to a field, uh, a football field uh, a park and, and you're in the middle and the, all the bleachers are completely full. Everybody's there. You're in the middle and you're saying, I'm taking a shower, <laughs> which is what you hear, see on Facebook, right? <laughs> or uh, I'm going out for pizza. And, you know, and that analogy tries to put it in a concrete sense because I think that this is a generation that is, is different from us, right? For us, things were very concrete. Uh, this is a generation that things that are not are concrete, that are more abstract, are being presented to them where they don't have the cognitive skills to deal with the abstract yet. 
And, 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 and then for us uh, as adults, it's a challenge. How do I translate this message in a concrete way to a child that will make sense? When I said that to him, his eyes were wide open. It's not like that. He said, yes, it's even worse. <laughs> Imagine three, four, five football, football parks uh, full of people, because that's what it is. Um, just from a psychologist's point of view, um, I guess the idea is why do adolescents feel more comfortable? I mean, because obviously the, their voice wants to be heard. So in the face-to-face -face interactions, why, have, uh, why don't they feel comfortable speaking face-to-face? -face? Or why is there that disconnect where, because obviously they have, like, you know, with the text message, obviously she has something to say. Um, why doesn't she feel like face-to-face -face that's going to get answered? Or, you know, why is it more comfortable? The easiest answer is that every self-disclosure has elements of both risk uh, and catharsis. I mean, the, the, the more intimate the disclosure, the more it feels good to connect with another human being and say what's on your mind. But intimate self-disclosures always risk shame. So more face-to-face -face disclosures are more self-conscious, often more shameful. So we distance ourselves from them, either through euphemisms or through technology. Other answers to that same question? Let's take another question. Back or when they're being manipulative and, and not maybe not doing intentionally in such a way that they are behaving at that moment for whatever reason they're going through. How hard is it to discern that from the message because the other person next to you is so much easier or at least you know, so much more obvious when they are being that way. Um, and just because of your experience, you know, you that it won't be so. But um, when they're when they're doing that or when they say things they don't necessarily mean, when they're texting them to you and you get that. Well, I would say it all comes back to, you know, if there, and I have gotten texts that were not totally clear to me. And I will say, I'm not fully understanding you. I think we need to talk about it, you know, depending on what it is. Um, and that does happen. And, and ultimately, it always comes back to something that has to be discussed face to face in the room. Um, but, but one thing that I, I would just like to add very quickly is I did have a thought when I was uh, coming up here today that when I see little kids, you know, two, three, four, and they're carrying around their little blankies like a transitional object, I had this thought about, you know, adolescence, and, and sometimes they will sit there in front of me, and they'll put that cell phone right on their lap. They don't use it, they do not text. Uh, trust me, not, that's not happening in the session. But it is almost like a little transitional object for them and this generation. Yes, sir. Uh, I just was wondering with the panel, uh, Thought of the uh, premise behind the book, uh, the Nicholas Carr book, The Shallows, that uh, computers and cell phones, because they make things actually easier in some ways to approach, to address, or over time rewiring the human brain to make it more difficult to think deeply. Mm -hmm. The issue of thinking deeply seems to be uh, an issue here in terms of. <laughs> You know, the problem is so and intimacy, and the, and the process of intimacy. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just saying, I was so struck when I was trying to review the literature with the fact that there's almost nothing on socioeconomic differences and differences in use and, ex and accessibility uh, to internet of, um, people that don't have the money to buy all the things that you want to buy. and uh, I just was wondering if in the clinic you noticed any difference. Well, I did find actually one article uh, that talks about socioeconomic um, status and the internet with adolescents. Uh, basically, they found that they are exposed, actually. Even if they don't have it at home, they, they will go to libraries, they will go to schools. And interesting, families nowadays, they will invest. 90% of the families in the United States has, have at least one computer in their house, including low-income families. In, I, in that regard, it's interesting to think about whether early access to different ways of learning and communicating has neurobiological implications. Right. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I, I, I feel it's a fascinating notion. Yeah, I feel we didn't. We, I wanted to get back to your question because I feel that those are the challenges we need to have. Like, make psychologists. We have to do now like a list of what are the areas that we need to start exploring on the impact of of, of internet, uh, because there's something about Im immediate gratification. There's something about issues that we traditionally thought that adolescents must learn in the process of becoming adults, 
right? Uh, issues of tolerance level, of threshold of tolerating uh, something, you know, all that is being challenged with internet because they're getting media gratification right away. Uh, you know, everything is so fast that we question what's gonna happen to all this uh, mechanisms that we feel that should be part of adulthood. Uh, time, we talked about boundaries before, now we're up against a time boundary. Let's take one more question, please. I guess so, I've, I've done a lot of training work in the corporate world, dealing with people and reading emails. And I don't have a deep psychodynamic background, so the question is to you. So it seems to me, like when people are interacting with texts and emails, it's easier because they're actually dealing with, they're reading it, they're projecting themselves more onto it than they would with a face-to-face -face interaction with another person. Projecting you know what in what that sense? So projecting yeah. as in like, I will read the email yeah. and I can interpret it the way my head voice thinks it should read as opposed to how you said it. I see. And so in some ways it's like interacting with yourself as opposed to another person. Has there, have you come across anything in the literature or looking at that? The issue was almost the psychodynamic one. Freud, when he started psychotherapy, wanted to be detached and anonymous and sitting behind the person, so there's very little social cues, so you project more. This gentleman is suggesting that the lack of face-to-face -face interaction allows you to project more of yourself into the message because there's less social cues involved. It's an interesting notion. I haven't come across yeah. any of that, but it's a fascinating notion. Um, and thank you all for coming. We'll hope you've enjoyed it.